Okay, uh, thank you again for the invitation uh, for this workshop. I'm very pleased for the invitation and hope to uh, inform and educate and entertain you about what I've been working on recently. Uh, I'm screencasting this and I have consent forms that I'll be distributing to all of you for, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna screencast it just to do some double duty. Um, so the title of my talk used to be Rebuilding Constructive Type Theory with Sidiu, and I had in mind some architectural mm -hmm. metaphors, but I don't know anything about architecture, so I decided to change to something a little different, Rediscovering Constructive Type Theory with Sidiu. Um, and we're here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, and so sort of like a nice lush green uh, feel was kind of what I was thinking of. And so in this talk, I want to seek out this kind of green type theory. Okay, I'm not a huge environmental, uh, I mean, I believe in the environment, of course, but uh, let's seek out this sort of green type theory by going back to a simpler time where we didn't have data. <laughs> it's very complicated data. Uh, and only lambda, okay? Um, and so the plan for the talk, I want to tell you about this Sedil tool we've been developing for some years in theory. Um, it kind of give you the motivation and its architecture. Then I have a kind of a case study that I'm actually pretty happy to tell you about. Since this is an invited talk at a workshop, all my interesting content is sort of like work in progress, not really established, not published yet. So, <laughs> okay. so I'm going to tell you about a histomorphic merge sort. Um, and then I'm going to tell you some current and future directions. Okay. So to start off, I want to tell you about the sort of motivation and architecture of Sedil. And we're going to, let's go together on a little bit of a mission to seek out some kind of greener type theory. And we're going to pass through some perilous and unexplored territory following the course of uh, the Missouri River. Um, well, the object of your mission is to explore the Missouri River and so its principal stream of it as by its course and communication with the water of the Pacific Ocean, which we're right by now, may offer the most direct and practicable water communication across this continent for the purposes of commerce. You're all familiar with this, I'm sure. No? Uh, <laughs> This is Thomas Jefferson's commission letter to Meriwether Lewis just a few days ago, several, several centuries back, uh, for the famous Lewis and Clark expedition across uh, the western part of the United States. And so together today, perhaps you'd like to join me to form a temporary core of discovery. Isn't that an awesome name? That's what they called their, their little band, the core of discovery. Um, this is a beautiful North Kunstler uh, painting of Lewis and Clark expedition. And uh, we're going to do this for a tour of recent history of type theory, okay? Relevance background for this. Um, so here's the map about the time when <laughs> we were traveling here several hundred years ago. And let's, let's pick some, let's see some interesting points along the route. Okay, so w look at this. They actually, the real journey started a little later, but there was this important stop here, and you recognize it on the map. Uh, here we are in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where John Reynolds, who of course was, <laughs> Recent passing at Pittsburgh, uh, CMU. Uh, Reynolds and Girardi invent System F in the 1970s. We have impredictive polymorphism, so we can form a type by quantification over all types, including the type we are, uh, possibly including the type we're defining. Um, and this is an extremely powerful system. It's hard to emphasize um, just how much power we have here. It's way beyond, as I understand it, the current ordinal analysis. For example, if you're a proof theorist, you don't know how to do an ordinal analysis of this system. Um, so there's a lot of power there, okay? Let's go to our next stop. Uh, here's St. Louis. This is where the Lewis and Clark expedition um, really got started going up the Missouri River here. You see this path. Um, and here in St. Louis, Missouri, um, now I, I don't think uh, Cook and Hugh had ever spent a lot of time on this river town, but uh, this is my identification point for the calculus of constructions, okay? So in the, in the mid to late 80s, they take system F and they add dependent types as in automath or in uh, martin Luck type theory. Um, and so, you know, the goal is to get to a constructive type theory we can use for reasoning, uh, programming, and proving. But we don't have induction in this theory. And they, they knew that. And Quavers, in not, uh, some, quite some time later, proved that by a model construction, uh, which is really pretty exciting. Um, let's move up the stream a little bit. Now, I circled Omaha. Um, but the Iowa Hawkeyes have uh, you know, some problems with Nebraska football, so we will not be in Omaha, but we'll be in Council Bluffs, Iowa, where in fact Lewis and Clark had an interesting meeting with six uh, American Indian chiefs, and they explain about now there's a new great father called Thomas Jefferson and blah, 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 this kind of thing. Anyway, so this stopping point is for Luo's extended calculus of constructions. So to the calculus of constructions, we add this predictive hierarchy, 
So you have prop, and then you have a hierarchy of universes above this. Um, you can, the, in predictivity, I actually had to double check this um, in the distribution of Lua, is extended. So you can quantify sort of way up and pull it down and still uh, form a prop. Um, and this has a you know more intricate analysis. Um, now we're going to go up the river a little bit more. Um, we're heading from the Missouri River, which is this big long one, to meet up to the Columbia River, which is going to come in there near uh, in the coast there on w Washington. And here we are in Great Falls, Montana, where it was a horrific portage. These guys, it was a tremendous tumbling waterfall, and they had the portage, all their stuff around it. It took days and days. You know, you have to worry about things like grizzly bear attacks. They weigh 800 pounds. Um, so in this dangerous spot, we find Werner's calculus and ductive constructions. 1994. So we, we add to, well, in fact, we add to CC, primitive inductive type. So it actually doesn't directly build on ECC. Um, later, you know, Cochran sort of synthesized these uh, together that we have uh, the predicative hierarchy and primitive inductive types. But we are finally ready after some time, not very long in the global scheme of human civilization, but, you know, some decades, we're ready to formalize math and computer science in a constructive uh, in predicative constructive type theory. And so there we are, we've reached the Pacific Ocean, which is Koch. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this is our little journey. Um, wait a second. <laughs> this is second year we are not supposed to Koch. Uh, Koch is fantastic. I'm a big fan of Koch. I hope many of or all of you are too. Um, but uh, she'd like to point out to them something that we didn't think about. We have locked in a fixed notion of inductive types. So we have to pick a notion of inductive type. Do you think the theory of inductive types is all settled now? We know everything there is to know about inductive types? Definitely not. <laughs> yeah, some people know better than I how much we still have to explore there. But we fixed this in in 1994. It's bolted into our theory now. And we do, you know, in fact, you, you can carve it in stone because we do this difficult meta-theoretic analysis for this particular notion of inductive types. And Worse than that, it's part of our core theory. So now, if you, um, you know, if you like to make any change, uh, if you want to have a small trusted computing base, a small axiomatization that you're resting on, you know, you've included now this notion of inductive types in there. Um, so I'm thinking, let's try the Platte River through Nebraska. I'm saying, let's take an alternate route. <laughs> let's not go. Uh, here, but I wanted to part actually right at the Iowa border. I want to go down that way, okay? And so, um, uh, I think that's it for my elaborate uh, uh, expeditionary metaphor. Um, so, uh, uh, Sadil is an attempt to go back in time um, to the point before we added the predicative hierarchy and definitely the point before we added the primitive inductive types and find a different way to get inductive types starting from CC. So it's the deal starts from CC, and then it adds just these three constructs, these three typing constructs. This is it. We have um, implicit products. This is uh, as of Mikhail, Alexandre Mikhail. Um, we have this exotic feature called dependent intersection types, which as I was sort of fumbling my way towards this language design, I was coming up with something that we need, something like this, and I was delighted to find that somebody already invented it. This is not new. So Kopilov, uh, in the 2000s, part of the New Pearl project, invented these intersections. Um, it's an intersection, you know, an intersection like something has both the first type and the second type. And a dependent intersection, so that's the subject has both T and T prime, but where we've instantiated this variable X with the, the subject itself. Um, so I'm not going to go through all uh, the particular, the, all the details carefully of this, but you know, it's a form of intersection type, but we have a dependency here. And then we use an untyped equality type, so you can equate terms, only terms, and they're not, not typed at all. Um, so you can reason about things that you cannot type. Um, so this is the, the essential idea of the theory. It's a small theory. We have a formal syntax and we have a realizability semantics for this that show that it's logically consistent. Um, uh, we have a little, uh, quite a small checker for this core language that's implemented about less than a thousand lines of Haskell. So yeah, we proved it sound. 
It's actually true and complete, which is how if there's all of a sudden their hair starts to curl and they get either angry or distressed or something. But it's okay to be, I mean, we can, you can have a train complete type theory that's still logically sound. You just, the places where you can write arbitrary terms, you know, have to be somehow kept away from the, the, the part of the language you intend to use as uh, <coughs> logic. And since uh, so Deal 1.1 was released a few months ago, um, we actually have data type notation. So this core language, um, we layer on top of this the surface language that lets you write data types in a familiar style and do pattern matching recursion in a not so familiar style, which I will show you. Um, and this, these notations are actually compiled down to inductive efficient lambda encodings expressed in this theory. So you can use data types and things that you're used to, but in the end, they all compile down to a pure type theory with no built-in data types. Um, <coughs> and so here's kind of the architecture of the system. We, we have an Emacs mode. I give you line counts just to get a sense for the scale where we are right now. So some, some interest in how big these, these keywords are getting. Um, so uh, you read in a .cdd file in through our Emacs mode, and the Emacs mode communicates with the back end that's written in about 13,000 lines of Agda. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the biggest like Agda code base intended to be used as a, for actually running code. <laughs> um, so I mean, this is compiled Agda through Haskell and all this. Um, and so we communicate back and forth, and I'm going to give you a small demo of this in a minute. And then if you want, you can ask the backend to generate a CDLE. This is calculus of dependent lambda eliminations. That's what we sort of call this core theory, uh, which you can feed into our 900 line of code Haskell checker, and it will check OK or not OK. Uh, maybe it's a good place to see if anyone has a question. I have a question. Yes? Um, why do you want to allow the ability to use about these Um. Well, that's a good question. Uh, it's, in a sense, it, it kind of, it comes, it arises pretty naturally from um, the fact that we are doing a Curry style theory, um, which is a big point that I didn't manage to fit onto the slide here. The theory is a Curry style type theory, so all the typing annotations that you need to convince the type checker to accept your term are just erased. And they're erased when you reason about your expressions, and they're also erased when you compile. I guess my question was more, um, is there a place where you need to be able to reason about things that you can't type? Um, but maybe that can wait till the end if it's not like No, no, this is a good question. Um, we, we have, from time to time, we've described ourselves as simply using a heterogeneous equality on typed terms. There are definitely places where we need heterogeneity. There are places where you need that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in fact, one of them will show up here in just a little bit. Now, I, don't, I can't tell you that, yes, for sure, that's a place we need untyped equality. It might be that we could just be using heterogeneous typed equality and we would be fine. But it's somehow kind of more simple. It actually just makes for a little bit simpler language design. If you want to simulate a typed equality, you can just write a, de a definition that says, give me two type terms, and then I'll give you this equation. So uh, it's a good question. Other questions? Um, so, uh, I want to give you a quick demo just so you get a sense of the, the tooling because we're actually put some effort into our tooling and pretty happy with what we have. Um, so I want to show you quickly uh, a couple of the files from Studio uh, Distribution um, for deriving induction and for casts and recursive types. So um, let's see, so here we are, I'm going to, here's a Studio source file. Um, I can make it even a little bigger. Um, so declaring some module for now. And now we're going to have a, a usual, this is a usual church encoding, the predicative lambda encoding of the natural numbers. So, you know, we have, ah, I've got some right triangles. We've actually changed this now. We can just put colon. But still, um, the nat type is the usual one for church encodings for all x, x, r, x, to x, to x. It's a type for a fold or a catamorphism over the nat. Um, uh, and then you have zero, you know, let the S lambda Z Z, you have a successor, takes in a number, and gives you lambda S lambda Z successor of the number, but now the number, you have to continue your catamorphism sort of over the, this predecessor. This is all, you know, what you have. This is completely standard. Um, uh, now, let me fire up studio mode here. You do Alt S, and you get syntax highlighting and this kind of thing. And the thing that's very nice 
is you get um, structured navigation so you can kind of step through with some keyboard shortcuts uh, and see what's going on. Um, and you get m more information than that. You have a little inspect buffer that gives you some information about the place you are. So it tells you the, the type or the kind of whatever instruction you're looking at. So this is a, this is a type, so that's kind star. Um, and you can see the context, the bound variables uh, in scope. So um, for deriving induction, so for, uh, what you do is, we, this is the interesting trick. So you, you have a predicate on church nats that expresses that they're inductive. I mean, this kind of idea is familiar. I mean, people have tried this in Kong as well. But we can do something a little stronger with these intersection types. So you have a predicate on, on these nat primes, these church nats, that says they're inductive. Okay, Just what you would expect for any predicate on nat primes. The step case holds, the base case holds, you get the property for, for an X. So it's a predicate of a particular nat prime. And now the definition of nat is nats are church natural numbers that are also proofs of their own inductiveness. This is the central idea for how we do lambda encodings in steel. This is due to Daniel Leibont, actually. I see one of Daniel Leibont's students here. Yes, hello. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and this is a brilliant observation of Daniel Leon's, which is that if you, from long ago, the 80s, you can find a reference in Baron Trek or a few other places, um, <coughs> that the proof that a piece of data is inductive is isomorphic to the, under Curry Howard, if you look at this proof as a lambda term, you'll get the church encoding of that piece of data. Um, and so here, in Leon's setting, you can have data built with some primitive constructors, and then you look at the proof of the the data is inductive, and you see it's isomorphic to the church encoding of the data. Here we say the data we care about is already church encoded, and so they're exactly the same. The data and the proof the data is inductive are identical, and so we can use an intersection tag. That's that's the basic idea. There's a few more steps you have to follow here. You need to get some reflection principle, which is reflection in the sense of uh, uh, sort of like categorical viewpoint. Thing. But these details I don't have time to go too much into. And I've talked about these other in public a bunch. So um, the other one I want to show you briefly, though, is because I will reference it a little later in the talk, is um, two summers ago we had every we would work on this project for maybe five or six years, and it kind of go along and go along, and then we have some pretty cool breakthrough discovery that we did not expect, and this is one of them. Um, so you can actually derive. I was girding up my lines and finding doctoral students to think about adding positive recursive types to the language, until we discovered you can already derive them. You don't need to add positive recursive types. They're derivable. This was pretty mind-blowing. And this is the, the file that derives them. And I, I don't think I'll walk through too many details here. Um, one thing I want to show you, though, is a bunch of our derivations we do are generic for any type scheme f. So this is a start-to-start -start type scheme. It doesn't need to be an actual functor in this case. A lot of these kind of developments, you want things to be functors, and you get some good properties out of them. But in, in some of our elements, we can we need weaker properties. And in fact, here, the only property you need um, to get uh, some of our encodings based on, on these recursive types, like a perigo encoding, if you're familiar with that, um, all we need is that this preserves casts. So if you have a cast for any types x and y, if you have a cast from x to y, then you get a cast from fx to fy. Um, it's like a monotonicity property if you think of a cast as an um, ordering. So if x is less than y, then fx should be less than fy. Uh, what is a cast? And this actually comes to Patty's question. Um, uh, let me just show you briefly that, and then I'm going to return to my slides. Um, a cast is, so a cast from a type A to a type B is something which is a function from A to B. So here we're going to use an intersection type again, you see. We have a cast function from A to B. And this cast function is also a proof that it equals the identity function, that equals lambda x. So here we have, we need some kind of, uh, we certainly need a heterogeneous equality because lambda x doesn't have type A. Um, it has like, you can have A today or something. Um, so a cast is, is a, as, as a function that's provably the identity that goes from A to B. Um, the only other weird detail in explaining this is you heard me say, well, we have a function for A to B, which is also a proof of this equation. We use something we call the Kleene trick 
for in Stephen Colclini's uh, numeric realizability, actually you have to f look back a little bit to find, but as the original definition of numeric realizability said, to realize the true equation, like, you know, one plus one equals two, um, you need to use like zero, I forget. Some particular constant is a realizer of this. But at some point in the 60s, I think it was, you can find there's a change where he says, actually, you know what? Any number can realize the true equation. It's fine. We don't need to pick a particular one. Just let any number realize the true equation. And we call this the cleaning trick. Uh, and we, we say that any term can realize the true equation. Um, and this gives us a sort of weak form of subset type. Because we have a type of A or B satisfying a property. Um, because the, the thing you have is a type A or B automatically can serve as a proof of that equation. Um, it's not a full form of subset type, but it's a, it's a weak one, and it, but it lets us do quite some cool tricks. Okay, so anyway, that's a quick look at the, the tool. Uh, I did, didn't show you many cool things you can do with it, but any questions about that? Yes? Uh, can you go back to the definition of natural numbers? Yes. So is it, is it true that these, uh, when you define data types like this, the definitions are not going to be generative? Right. Yes, good, good observation. Yes, indeed. And in fact, we had a pa ICFP paper last year where we in fact exploited this to say that you can have zero cost coercions, like constant time coercions, from think types like list and vector. When you translate these down, uh, they have exactly the same representation. So if they were generative, that would, that would not be the case. And, and also, that, that I was thinking that can help with libraries, for example, because I found when, when I work with things like Agda is that simple types, people redefine them all the time. Like you have unit type everywhere, you have booleans everywhere, you have even natural everywhere. And that would allow you to, to just seamlessly talk to those types if you want them. That's a good point. Thank you for this observation. I didn't think of that before. That's, that's quite true. So you're saying like, sort of for library interoperability, oh, this library is phrased with this one now, and I don't want to like refactor and pull the common part out. Yes. Thank you. That I will uh, put this in our next paper. <laughs> I have to make sure to I get your name so I can thank you. <laughs> uh, that's a good thing about coming to a workshop. Okay. Um, okay. So if nothing else, I will continue with my slides. Oh yeah. Sir, can you show the um, the type for the uh, the cast again? Yes. Um, so, what is the, the proof uh, entity there? Is it a number or is it a, no. a function? No, it's when you form these intersections, you're saying I've got something, let's call it cast, that's a, an A to B function. Mm -hmm. And that very same something also needs to have the second type in the intersection. Okay. So, the function itself is the, the is proof. the proof. Now, you say, that seems weird. How can that be a proof? It's through this cleaning trick where we just say anything. In fact, even you know, omega, like even diverging lambda terms or whatever, are allowed to serve as proofs of true equations. So we actually have a top type from this trick as well. You can type any term. That's why I said it's turing complete. So any term you like can be given the type top defined to be just some arbitrary true equation. So, so, it's, so it's very different from the equality type that I've been right? Oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so different that people probably don't like to hear. <laughs> yeah. So all your data types are first order. Uh, well, um, right now in our data type surface language that we can elaborate down, um, we allow positive data types. They don't have to be strictly positive. No. And they are first order, that's first order right now. The talk I gave yesterday at LFMTP was about work in progress towards extending for with higher abstract syntax. But that's not ready yet. Okay, because your functor like items that are not functors yeah. all have type star to star. So everything's first order. So uh, no star over star over star. Oh, this we can do. This we can do. Yes, you can have parameters and indices to your data types that have arbitrary. Even higher order functors or non functors mm -hmm. in your case. Yes. Okay, so when you wrote f has type star over star, that's not a restriction. That's a particular. Well, I will come back to this point okay. a little later in the talk. This particular development only work is only set up for. Um, like this definition of, of recursive types is really only going to build for you uh, this rec is the actual recursive type you get at the end. That's kind of star. So if you wanted like a nat index or a, some other type index or anything else, 
this particular development won't do for you. I don't want index, I want higher order. But okay, but I understand that the F is sort of star. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you for your good questions. Other questions? Then I'm going to go back to my slides. Okay. Um, all right, so now I want to tell you uh, about this sort of like a little bit bigger example in Sedil. It sort of shows some interesting features um, that we were able to sort of figure out at the lambda encoding level and then lift up to the surface language in an interesting way that lets you write some programs that um, you can't really write in a d that I know of in a direct way in Cocker Agda. So one of these is merge sort. <laughs> so a classic merge sort, we are all computer scientists, we're familiar with this algorithm. You start with the list, you split somehow into hopefully equally sized sublists, you recursively sort, and you merge the result. Okay. This is very simple. Um, in Haskell, you could write, you can write this code. In fact, this is on the Rosetta code where they give you all these different code uh, implementations in different languages for, for the basic algorithms. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I guess we should just see the split in the merge. So here we do a split, we get two lists, we recursively sort those guys, and we merge them. Okay, very simple. Um, but this is not so simple in type theory. If you're not familiar with this, <laughs> you will be sad to know. This is actually kind of, it's sort of depressing. This is almost like a challenge problem for type theory. Merge sort, really? <laughs> that's, that's, that's not so good. Um, what's the problem? Well, splitting and merging are structurally recursive. That's not a problem. But this merge sort function is not structurally recursive, right? We start with a list, we split it into two other lists. These are not structural sublists of the list we started with, and now we reverse. Okay, that's not good. Now you can deal with that. Okay, it's not like that's outside of the scope of techniques. In fact, many techniques can be applied to deal with this. You can do well-founded recursion on the length of the list. Um, you can use size types. That's kind of probably the preferred Agda way to do it is size types. Um, you can use inductive domains, and there's a really nice survey paper I read recently, Partiality and Recursion in Directive Theorem Provers. I recommend this. It covers a lot of different methods used in type theories and in classical provers for dealing with this kind of problem. Um, but this is kind of, you know, this isn't really fine. I mean, this is like, you know, if you want to do and and or and list concatenation, you're fine when you move from sort of a regular functional language to a type theory. But when you want to do this, all of a sudden it's like, wow, you've got to go find the power drills and the big tools and start. I mean, that, that's sort of sad that it's so complicated. Um, now, there is a different merge sort algorithm that you might know of. I actually wasn't aware of this until recently, called bottom up merge sort. Do you know about this? Um, think about your merges that you want to do when you're doing merge sort as kind of growing up in a tree like this. You merge pairs, then you've got, list, you, you've got a list of, of uh, singletons, you do some merges pairwise, now you've got a list of, uh, list of size two, and you go up like that. Um, that's good, that's a, li a little bit different perspective. Can that help us? Well, <laughs> it's also bad <laughs> for type theory. Why is that? Here's, again, some Haskell for this. Um, it's right here, because you know, you're gonna do this in layers, so you merge your singletons, and now you've gotta just kind of recurse on this list of new, a uh, little bit bigger so, uh, lists. And so here you call merge all with your, with your list, list of sorted sublists. Uh, and then you, you merge, you basically take care of a layer and then you recurse right there. That's definitely not structurally recursive. Again, it's like some sizes maybe are going down, and well they are going down in this sort of thing, but this is not structurally recursive. Um, you know, merge pairs is gonna decrease the size of the list if it's not null, <laughs> right, if it's, um, so there's some like, this is not an easy one to deal with either. So I have a new variant to show you for this that I call prefix merge sort, okay? So you're gonna do your merges kind of like bottom up merge sort, but starting from the left of the list, you're gonna work your way in exponentially increasing chunks towards the right. So you do merge, 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 then do another one, put that together, merge, 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 like that. So you basically build this tree of merges. Instead of doing it layer by layer, you kind of build this way, and you're growing bigger and bigger as you move to the right. Okay, so a little more specifically. So for increasing k, starting from zero, let's let p be the prefix <coughs> of length to the k that you already sorted. So let's imagine we already sorted a piece of this. Now, um, go get the bottom up merge sort of the next two to the k elements, okay? And then merge those together to get your new uh, p. Okay, and you stop when your list is empty. Okay, um, so in Haskell, you can write it like this. 
Um, so we have some function take pow2. Uh, let's actually, I walk through this just a second for more detail here. Yeah, so we have a function that's structurally recursive on the nap to pull in the next two to the however many, two to the k elements and sort them. Um, and we take the head and the tail here of the list. So, you know, we've got this big list, we still need to gobble up some elements and sort them. We take the head and the tail of that. Um, and we do that to make sure that right here, when you make this call, that, you know, so we, we get back from here, you get back uh, the sorted, new chunk of sorted list that you have, and then the rest of the list you still need to gobble up, okay? So uh, this T prime is the rest of the list you need to gobble up, and this S is the part of size, size two the K that you've managed to sort. And we want to make sure that this is a sublist, possibly identical, but, but that's less than or equal to, uh, structurally less than or equal to T. And we do that so that when you make this recursive call from some loop here that's, that's going through and increasing the size of the tree as we move to the right, that from here to here, there's a structural decrease. Okay. Now you say, uh, thank you for this fascinating tutorial about merge sort, but uh, I don't really see how this is going to help us, this way of viewing the problem. This still looks like a big disaster for putting into type theory. And yeah, actually, I have no idea how to do this in Cocker Agda. I, I tried some. I'm sure a smarter uh, Agda programmer could figure out how to do it. Um, but we can do it in Cedil very nicely. That's what I wanted to show you. Um, so Cedil implements histomorphic recursion. So um, what this means, in a summary, which I should have written there, is that um, you can make recursive calls on any data, subdata that you can manage to extract out of a piece of data. You can dig, 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 dig in a piece of data in some unbounded way and find some subdata way down there and make a recursive call. Um, so when you do a pattern matching recursion on an inductive type D, what Sadil gives you is an abstract type A um, and a function to use for recursive calls on type A. So you know we, we use this abstract type to, um, you can't just make recursive calls on anything, of course. You have to somehow establish that what you're making a recursive call on was derived structurally from the starting data. And so this abstract type A serves as the type for anything that you could structurally extract from the data. And so you can make recursive calls on that type. And you also get evidence that A is, quote, uh, D-like. What does it mean to have a type that's D-like? Well, it can be decomposed like D. You can take it apart. And furthermore, you can always cast it back to D. So as you're digging through some list or something, you're using this abstract type A. You, you get the tail of the list as, an abs as typing, having type A. Now you can decompose that tail more, like get the tail, the tail, the tail, the tail, and it will still have type A. And if at some point you say, enough, enough, I just want to go back to D, you can cast it back. What's it to having an A being a view of D? A is like a view of D. But it's, it's abstract because it, um, you can't inject it to A. Right? That would be a disaster. I cannot, in a sense, construct new data and put it into A, because now I can make recursive calls that have no relation to that. That's what I started with. Yeah, it's like a view of, the, of D that gives you, that's sort of restricted a little bit. Um, and so when you declare a data type, so deal automatically adds a predicate for being D-like, and it adds a few helpers, which I will show you. Um, so here, let's just take our good friend as functional programmers, which I hope you all are. <laughs> that's the only way to fly. Um, the uh, list data type is one of our best friends. Um, so here's the Cedil notation. You can have a parameter here. Notice that this is really a parameterized definition, so you don't need to repeat the parameter again and again. In Agda, uh, parameters actually can have some funny properties that make them look more like indices. Uh, anyhow, um, so when you have this declaration in Cedil, you can check using the little editor, I showed the structure navigation I showed you. It will tell you, well, it's introduced a few things for you, just like Cock will introduce some stuff for you when you introduce a data type. So here it introduces this predicate that says something is list-like. And it's list-like where you have to specify the type of the elements in the list. So this, it introduces this predicate. Uh, it introduces evidence that the actual list type itself is list-like, which you would hope, <laughs> right? So the list type is list-like, that's good. Um, and it introduces this thing, as I was mentioning, where you can cast. So if you have a list-like type X, and you've got something of that type, then you can cast it to, uh, to an actual list. So this is like, as you said, the view. This is kind of leaving the view. You're allowed to leave the view. You just kind of enter the view, except as recursion. Let's see. 
Uh, this fat arrow, for those who want to know the syntax of everything I'm writing, which is a good impulse, of course. Uh, this is for an erased input. So this is like the implicit product, like I think that was for all. Um, but where the we don't actually need a name for this because it's not being referred later in the time. It's just saying, I take some erased proof that the thing is listed. Okay, now let's look at loop helper function in Cedillo, and we'll see uh, how we use these tools to write uh, this histomorphic recursion. So again, here's a Haskell code, um, this sort of inner loop that's increasing the size, the, the depth of the tree that you're sucking up. Um, in Cedillo, okay, it doesn't look quite as good as Haskell. I mean, Haskell was very, very nice for writing concise code, and we're not quite at that level yet. Um, in particular, one sad thing is we have to write this kind of long. Uh, type annotation for what, just for the type of loop. And it has to configure out the typing for the type of loop in this case, and we cannot do this. Um, so, but what, here what I want to show you is this mu construct introduces a pattern matching recursion in Cedillo. So you kick off a pattern matching recursion over some data t. Now it's a little different from like a fix in Cock or something like that because this is initiating a pattern, it's initiating a, a, some kind of fancy version of a fold over a particular piece of data. So you say, I want to recurse, and I'm going to use loop as the name for my recursive function, over some particular piece of data t. Um, and that seems weird until you think of it as like, oh, we just want to do catamorphisms, we want to do folds. So to do a fold, you give me something you want to fold over. Um, so, uh, and then you write cases, and so this, all this sort of pattern matching notation, yes, we don't have nested patterns. We don't have these nice equations that I also really like in Haskell and Agda. But, you know, we can hopefully get there. Um, uh, these are the things that are elaborated down to pure lambda terms by the elaboration process. Um, okay, and so ah, and then the other thing I want to introduce here on the slide. So here, where we do, uh, you know, in the Haskell code, you make this call to this helper function that takes the tree of the, uh, two to the n or whatever. And you immediately decompose the result, right? So you use a pattern matching left. And here um, in Cedil, if you want to do a simple pattern match, not kick off a big catamorphism over some data, but just a simple pattern match, we write mu prime. So we're matching, this mu prime is like the equivalent of doing, and, and the matching on the pair is the equivalent of the nicer Haskell syntax let pair equal. Okay. Okay, so that's, those are kind of the, you know, you have pattern matching recursion, and you have simple pattern matching, mu, mu prime. Um, now let's see what you actually get when it's time to write a histomorphic recursion. I showed you what you get for the data type that Cedil sort of provides for you, the tools. And here, let's see what you get for histomorphic recursion. So um, let's look inside. What, what would be available in the body of this cons uh, clause here, this definition? Well, you get an abstract type. Remember, I was mentioning for histomorphic recursion, you've got some Abstract view, that's a great, we use this terminology too, I should have said it from the beginning. You have a view of the, the list type that you're recursing over. And this, we name it in a uniform way, so it's called type slash loop. This is the abstract type for the sub data of t. Um, then you get, okay, here I did a little shadowing. So this t in here, it's sub data, it's the tail of the list, and it has this abstract type. You see, the pattern matching recursion presents you the sub data at the abstract type, not at the original data type. You have this function, the, to make recursive calls, if you're given something of that abstract type and then you're given the other arguments you need for your recursive call, then you can, you can make a recursive call. Uh, and finally, you need, we talked about this evidence that types are list-like, we need evidence that this, this uh, abstract type is list -like. Okay. Um, and we're going to use that evidence, you can see right here, it's actually getting used. This is type slash loop. Um, that's the evidence that the abstract type is list-like. And that evidence is going into this take pow2 function. And so the take pow2 function now says um, for any type that's list-like, you give me some of the inputs I need and you give me something of that type and I'm gonna give you back the sorted list out of there and the remaining list-like data. So we've dug through the list gobbling up a tree, a first two to the k, two to the uh, n tree, and there's something left over, and that left over comes out at t. And notice, you can probably, if you're, if I'm managing to explain myself okay, you will see that um, this is kind of like a, a size type without the nonsense, and <laughs> sorry, without the machinery of size types. We say, you take in 
something of this type T and you get something back out of that type T, that tells the code outside of this it's safe to make recursive calls on this thing. I didn't have to explicitly reason that sizes are going down or something like that. Okay, now in this big code snippet here, which again, it, some notation that, of Haskell-like notation would make it nicer to read. But I want to show you, highlight one thing, which this is the cool little idea that my doctoral student had for how to lift our, um, this histomorphic uh, land encoding to the service language level. You can do, this mu prime accepts evidence that the type of the thing you're matching on is list-like. So right here, this little notation means I would like to match on L. L isn't a list. It's not any inductive data at all. It's just some abstract type T, but I have a proof that that's list-like. I have a proof that it's OK to match on that. And this is actually really great, because it's what enables us to pull this function out, uh, you know, out of the body of, um, uh, of this uh, prefix merge store and just have it as a separate uh, piece of code. And we're, again, we're tracking sort of the structural relationship of this input-output is showing up here by the re repeated use of T. So to sort of summarize the big picture here, you've got, um, you've got a merge function. OK, that's, that's straightforward. You've got this function, which we just walked through, that works on lists like Ts and gives you back lists like Ts. And then you've got your merge sort and this loop function. Um, and so basically, we can, we can define this thing, this take how to outside of merge sort and we can recurse on the values that it uh, take on two returns. And that's all we need to do. We don't need any more elaborate tricks than that to convince our implicit type-based termination checker that this is fine. Um, so this is uh, quite a bit more flexible than nested recursions and lexicographic recursions. Because you can pull these things out. Like a nested recursion, that's great, but you cannot really extract that. I mean, this, this lets you extract these things uh, outside the, the outer loop. Um, so that's how we define it. And um, how does it perform? Well, <laughs> uh, you might know this. Actually, classic merge sort is kind of bad. <laughs> you can find this on the internet various places. So it doesn't do very well. I wrote a little test in Haskell for this. We generate lists of size of 100,000 to a million. Uh, of elements from a minnet to max integer, and we just, as a separate process, we do this one at a time. We sort these lists, we print them out to make sure we don't get <laughs> un unwanted laziness. <laughs> uh, and so the classic is, is quite a bit behind. Um, the bottom up here is the best, and the, but the prefix one is really uh, very, very close here. So, um, so in other words, we can write a performance uh, merge store this way. Uh, any questions? What? Yeah. You're right. It does. Yeah, that's a little weird. I don't really. I can't explain that. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's well. I mean, it's linear times the logarithmic factor, so we'd expect this look yeah. to be. What? Logarithm of 10. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's more numbers. It's, well, it's, 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 it's 1 million, right? Yeah, it's, but still, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is strange, but this isn't uh, our strangeness. So, um, okay. So now I want to tell you uh, about some current and future directions in Cindio. Um and this is going to get increasingly out there. <laughs> so um, the first one comes back to something Patty was asking about. So the first thing, um, this we we're, we're right now we're on one point one Cindio, and for one point two which hopefully would be something that we release like before the end of the year, we would like to do something we call schematics to deal. Okay, so what is that? Now when you run out of power in your logic, because don't forget, you must run out of power at some point if you're gonna be sound. That's a famous result. <laughs> Summarized at a high level, right? Um, at some point, your system won't have some power you want. What, would you, what should you do? In type theory, 
so far the answer has been, what's out of predicative hierarchy? Um, we'll just extend it, and it goes to omega, so you can always keep going. And But this is a bit of a lie, because, you know, the second you go, you have a predicative hierarchy, you say, dang, I really want to do universe polymorphism, so I'd actually like to add an ordinal above that. And before you know it, <laughs> you're growing an ordinal index predicative hierarchy, which is like, the, the, the tail of the dog is like being beaten against the side of the shed by his tail wagging it so hard. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's some, I, I'm, I'm sort of anti-predictive hierarchy. So there's complexities with level expressions, and yes, this temptation to keep going. There is a time-honored alternative in logic. Go schematic. <laughs> this is a basic idea of logic that somehow hasn't really made it into mainstream use in type theory. Um, so what does that mean? What does schematic mean? Well, it means that you're allowing some form of parameterized definition that's not actually expressible internally within your language. You're sort of using some power at the meta language that can't be um, reflected down into the language itself. So in type theory, you were talking about having definitions that exceed the allowed products of your type theory. Okay, so a simple example which we can do in this video right now, it's not any extension, this is not like, we rarely have occasion to use it, but every once in a while this is handy, is we can have parameterized kind definitions. So you can say I'm defining a kind kappa to be i arrow star, but if this is parameterized, you can specify what the index i here is. Um, and why is this schematic? Because in Cedillo, with our particular structure, sort structure, you cannot actually form this abstraction, lambda i, i arrow star. You know, you, you would want that to have something like, you know, star arrow box. This product isn't, isn't the kind of, you know, this is not the classifiable in Cedillo. Our sort, sorting system doesn't let you have this. So we give you this definition, but it doesn't, it can't be reflected down into an abstraction of the type theory. And so if you do this, in a sense, what you're doing is something like a typed macro. Everywhere you um, want to use this kappa, you have to supply this, because it doesn't have any, you have to supply this a value for i. Because it doesn't have any independent typable existence. It's like you, you must give it. And this is, very, you know, this actually, as I said, we don't really use this much. But um, we want to go beyond this, and this addresses Patty's question about, I hope, addresses your question about higher order things. So, we are working on extending our language design to have uh, telescope generic developments. So that you could parameterize, not by just like some simple things, but you could parameterize by a whole telescope abstracted with some telescope variable. What's a telescope? It's a dependent sequence of declarations. So you could say a equals star little a of type a. It's just a sequence of declarations like this. It's a familiar idea in many presentations of type theory. And so we want to allow definitions and modules to be parametric in a gamma that's a telescope. So you could say, this, this thing works for any telescope you want. Uh, and so that means you need to form products over these things with lambda abstractions and applications. And the benefits of this, well, we have, more, we have generic developments. So now, right now, this recursive types development I showed you, um, if you wanted to do that for an index or a higher order uh, type scheme, you, you could do that, but you would have to repeat the derivation. You write the same stuff again, but instead of having a B star, it has to be a star, a star, it's a star, whatever you want. Um, but with this setup, you would just write one telescope generic derivation, uh, and that would serve for those. Yes? Um, are telescopes lines, or can you have a tree of declarations? Sorry. So do I have to only use the latest uh, oh. level in my context? No, it's it's you get, uh, I guess, I mean, it's a linear, I, I think of it as a linear sequence of declarations, but you don't have to use the immediate preceding one. You can, yeah, you could linearize a tree. But as the a order telescope. matters. The order matters, because there is no, the order matters because of dependencies, but, but, right. you, you, but can, you can depend on anything. In yeah, a, you know, yeah. In multiple times. With yes, things. yes. There's no, we are not have any kind of linearity in our system. Um, so, you know, uh, so if we're doing things like having lambda encodings with different parameter index lists, a conductive, like a vector type that's parameterized by a type and indexed by a nat, um, this would let us capture that in a single go. We can handle those now, but we end, end up handling kind of like generating special purpose instances of, of the code for those. Um, and so we might, in, right now, it's to deal when we our code for elaborating data types down to the pure theory. It's got some kind of complicated stuff for generating these things uh, dependent on the telescope. This would let us pull that out of the com our compiler and just have it as a library file. It's like telescope generic derivation. So for something like 
The rec type I showed you, we can't, this isn't implemented yet. We're still working out the theory of this. But this is the kind of thing you want to let you do. You say, for any telescope gamma, any f that's a gamma star to a gamma star type scheme, then for do the repeat this stuff. In the end, you get a gamma to star recursive uh, object. So you could instantiate this, for example, by a particular telescope, like NAT, N N NAT, if you want a NAT index recursive type, for example. Okay? All right, so that's one um, sort of future direction. Again, a workshop being a nice place to air some of these ideas. Um, an another one that's now, as I told you, we're getting increasingly spacey here from my perspective. Um, so, and this one, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this at Lix because I'm hoping that you will perform your spiritual work of, the mercy, of mercy for the day and correct, instruct the ignorant if I'm unaware of some work on this line that I should be. Um, so, native disjunctions and existential types is something I would like to add in a little bit later version of Studio. So we can encode existential types and disjunctive types. We can church encode them. That's no problem. Like here is a church encoding of an existential type. Um, you know, you just say, uh, um, you use the, the implicit product to say like this A, where we're basically trying to say exists some, something of type A that satisfies predicate B. And you just do this sort of double negation kind of church encoding of that. Um, and you use the implicit product to say that that's, that's an erased thing. That this witness that exists, it's not really there. It's, you just think it exists, but you're not providing it in your actual uh, term. Uh, and so you see, when you, have, when you form a witness, if you're given an er erased A and a proof that A's, this A satisfies B, then the code you put for this um, is you say lambda C, C of this minus A means uh, C takes in an erased input. This C is the thing that has this type, this for all type here. So this little A here is, has a minus because it means it's an erased input. And indeed, when you erase it, you get lambda C, C, B. Okay? Um, so we can have these kind of existentials with erased witnesses if we want them. But sometimes it would be very nice if witness A, B just erased B. Here we erase this funny thing that takes in a C and calls C immediately on B. That is not equivalent to B. Um, uh, so, you know, this is not, I call it, this is not a true existential type. This is trying to simulate it, but it has this deficit that it's not, when you erase the, this expression, you don't get B, you get this thing. We also actually maybe like to have n-array disjunctions for some use case we have in mind. Uh, actually related to this, like, idea of uh, interoperability. Um, if you imagine you want to embed NATs as ordinals, they're not isomorphic, but there is an embedding of NATs ordinals. And if you set things up carefully in your lambda encodings, a representation of a NAT will literally be the same representation as that ordinal. Okay? But for this, as we work this out, it seemed like maybe having primitive disjunctions would be better so that you can say each K instead of a big long sequence of binary injections. Okay? Now, disjunctions and existentials, as you know, have a long and sorrowful history, it's like trail of tears, <laughs> uh, in proof theory, based on these unpleasant eliminations, right? So if you have T as a existential type, um, then you can eliminate it, but you know, what you're eliminating, you, you've got some other unrelated formula C here that's retained in this premise and this to the conclusion. And same thing with disjunctions. If you prove a disjunction, you've got a C and C and you've got it over here. So this, this raises like a host of annoying technical problems that you can find a string of impressive <laughs> papers trying to handle. But you know, really the problem here, I, I have, this is the part you can correct me on if I'm missing some something. I, I think I have a new, I, I like to think it's a new perspective on this problem. So we all know that this is really somehow some kind of bad residual of sequent calculus, the, of a cut in sequent calculus that kind of didn't make it, kind of didn't get, get ri wasn't um, eliminated. Um, so, hmm, okay, so like sequent calculus. Well, let's think about sequent calculus and natural deduction. Let's think about natural deduction as emerging from sequent calculus, which of course is historically the reverse. Um, we know that everyone sort of knows this. The left rules of sequent calculus give rise somehow to natural deduction eliminations, and the right rules are straightforwardly introductions. And so when you have a sequent calculus proof, in a sense, you're trying to pivot, you're kind of like trying to rip the proof around 
so that the eliminations are at the top. You know, you have these lefts and rights that you're doing alternately as you go. You kind of want to move the lefts all the way to the top and do eliminations and eliminations and then introductions, at least for normal proofs. Okay? And so for the nice connectives, that works fine. But or and exists, we get stuck. Okay? So I have a <laughs> this is like, okay, don't don't tell everybody like the guys full of baloney. Um, this is like a new, uh, hopefully a new idea on how to get unstuck here. And it actually comes from this crew style typing perspective uh, that we have in Sedil. So that's why I thought I would include this here. Um, so let's assign natural deduction terms to sequent proofs. You can find many papers that try to do something like that. The right rules get assigned introduction forms, and the left rules are going to get elimination forms somehow. <laughs> Where? How? Okay. Here's my proposal. So let's say we have some fragment of intuitionistic propositional logic here. Um, and we have usual term constructs, lamb abstraction elimination, you know, arrow introduction elimination, uh, conjunction introduction elimination. And now I'm writing these weird guys for um, that are new, okay? And here's the shocking idea. Again, some of you are looking at the shocking idea and found it was bad, you just tell me. Um, let's have context not, not give assumptions of typings for variables, but assumptions of typings for arbitrary terms. So a context is going to say, let's, I will let you assume that this term has this type. Again, this kind of doesn't really make a lot of sense in a church setting or an intrinsically typed setting because terms just have a particular type. You don't need to assume they have weird other types. But in a query style setting, it makes sense to assume that some term has a type. I mean, Nupro, you know, has a similar kind of, you know, decoupling of typing and term syntax. We are almost out of time. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, all right, I'm almost out of material. So, um, so then your axiom says, well, if you're assuming a typing, you can use it. Um, you know, like and left says if, if you had assumed a typing like this, well, you have to retain it maybe for kind of structural reasons. But then you can also assume these typings. Now, of course, the interesting one is or. Okay. So check this out. <laughs> if you assume if you're assuming a typing a, a disjunction like this. Let's do, you know, you just this is absolutely the rule you want to write if you just eliminate the term parts. So the term parts we put in are saying, okay, you can do a, what I'm calling a co-projection of T like this. And now you have two terms that prove this, and you need to put them together somehow. So you put them together with something that's supposed to be like a parallel operator. Um, uh, and so basically it says that or in a natural reduction form, I propose we have co-projections like this and the usual introductions. And the key thing about this rule, this or left rule, is ensuring that one of these branches is going to succeed. Because failure is if you have inject one and you try to do the second co-projection, or inject two and you try to do the first co-projection, right? That would fail. That doesn't make sense. You can't do that. And so this rule is ensuring that at least one, possibly both, of these branches is going to succeed. OK? So I don't know how to do this in natural deduction style yet, but all right, and now I'm being reminded that it's time to be done, and I am done. So we followed the Missouri River, which is calculus of constructions. We took the North Platte from Omaha. So <laughs> we uh, have this theory with these extra operators. We're heading south, and maybe it's getting a little hotter into histomorphic recursion uh, and so forth. We're going towards the Pacific, which is like the ultimate type theory. We might be now in the Grand Canyon. I don't know. Um, and so I'd like to thank our current development team and alums. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay, we're almost out of time, but we do have time for one question or two, maybe. We have some discussion. And in fact, you had a con cancellation, so I don't like to hold everyone up, but you, you don't have, you have like an hour now, right? Well, we need well that's true. We have to but we also have to kind of keep with the other. Oh, yes, yes. Break sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 And people. Right, right, right. John, I hear how you do types in CDs compared to the one of Cock or uh, That's a good question. Um, well, the ones that we have actually added surface language support for, we don't have, for example, induction recursion, which you have in Agra. We actually know how to do small induction recursion uh, at the lambda coin level, but we didn't pull that into the, the surface syntax. Um, so. Um, yeah, we have probably have 
I, I mean, it's a bit hard because there's some very particular restrictions. Oh, well, for example, we allow positive recursive types. In Kong and Agda, they have to be strictly positive. So we're more, more relaxed than this one. Any, any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.